Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In today's episode, I welcome a veteran in Hollywood, and during our conversation, he mentioned informative interviews. What is an informative interview? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? An informative interview is an informal conversation entrepreneurs can have with someone working in an area of interest to the entrepreneur. It is an effective research tool and it is best done after preliminary online research. It is not a job interview and the objective is not to find job openings. Informative interviews allow an individual to explore a role much deeper. Think of a dream job. Most likely someone already has it and that is okay. The goal is not to take over that individual's job right now and push them to the curb. In fact, the way the entrepreneur structures questions is also important. More on that later. One major goal of an informative interview is to understand how the current individual got to that specific role. However, it is important to reach out to professions in that line of work. There may not be too much value in asking a financial accountant how to get a job as a graphic designer, for example. Asking professionals in the appropriate arenas is just as important as the question structures during the informative interview. When I wanted to build my profession in healthcare, I had an informative interview with one of my mentors at the time. I asked about the routes this individual took in their professional development to get to the level they had risen to. We discussed what track I was on professionally as well. I understood the importance of an informative interview and leveraged its benefits. I took that information and I focused on building in areas we discussed that needed attention, experience in the field, knowledge in this specific area, etc. That informative interview eventually turned into a job opportunity, and that is why the informative interviews are important. I started out the informative interview stating my purpose. I'm here to discuss this role as I'm interested in doing this in my career. Again, the relationship between the two roles must be relevant to the individual entrepreneur you are talking to. If an entrepreneur walks into a CEO's office and says, I want your job, they're going to laugh at the entrepreneur. Common questions asked during an informative interview after the entrepreneur has stated their purpose and relevance. Tell me about the career path. What do you like? What do you dislike? What kind of training or education is needed? Ask to be referred to another professional. This can be done via email, either on behalf or simply a professional request with a note linking back as to how and why the entrepreneur is reaching out. If the informative interview is with an employee in an organization of interest, ask about the culture, work-life balance, ask questions that are relevant to the role and important to the entrepreneur. This can be done virtually or in person, perhaps over coffee. When constructing an email, make sure it is professional. Include the company name, your name, title. There are plenty of examples of business professional emails online. Google email business templates if you need some help. Personally, I believe in-person is always best, but above all else, be courteous and appreciative. These individuals are taking time out of their day to help lend their knowledge and expertise, and that is why the entrepreneur should care. Informative interviews are really an opportunity to pick the brain of someone more experienced than the entrepreneur. These individuals do not have to agree to meet with anyone. However, when they do, listen closely. This is free education and shared knowledge. Leverage their network as well as your own. After all, informative interviews are just one way to network in a network of entrepreneurs. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest has worked in Hollywood for over 30 years. He has worked for Harper Films, Mandalay Entertainment, Sony Pictures, Disney, and is now a chief financial officer. Please welcome the Hollywood CFO and author of How to Make in Hollywood, Tim Tatora. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am him here with Tim Totora. Look, I'm tripping over my own words because we're going <laughs> to talk about all sorts of crazy stuff. Tim, how are we doing today, buddy? 
Very well. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming by. Thank you for being on the show. So first, let's give a little background. Who is Tim? Where are you calling from? And uh, like, give him a little background. Who who are you? Uh, Background. So at the present time, I'm a CFO. I manage about a dozen clients in Hollywood. We make a lot of TV movies, probably do about 10 of them a year. Some branded content, a little bit of episodic. And uh, it's for me, my business is really centered around back end processing, software, technology that goes along with that, and then marrying uh, financing with uh, producers and specific kind of financing. We, we factor paper, we take distribution paper from uh, various distributors and exhibitors around the world, and we go to a bank and say, we need a million or whatever the number is. Nothing gets made for a million anymore, but for round numbers. We need a million dollars. We have about 700,000 in cash flow today. We need 300. The balance is going to come here and there. And this is how it's going to happen. So we go find that money. We close a gap. That's what we do. Okay. That's what I do specifically. Nice. Uh, my background, I, I came up through the ranks in every crappy job in Hollywood you can imagine. <laughs> Working in the trenches. I started as a tape op in a recording studio and just you know, spent whatever, I guess that was it, 1985. So it's 37 years of doing whatever to I've, I've been movie stupid since I was a kid yeah, and I've done whatever it takes. <laughs> so you mentioned you've been in Hollywood for over 30 years. Yeah. How did, how did that start? How did your kind of get your transition into Hollywood? Uh, it's all I ever wanted to do when I was a kid growing up. I remember I grew up in Southern California. I grew up in Fullerton, California, which is just in the border of LA and Orange County. And I remember going to the theater when, when I say theater, meaning stage plays, the Pantages and okay, the Schubert yeah. theater when yeah. I was a kid. My parents had season tickets and I remember driving by the studios, looking in the gate, looking at the gate and thinking to myself, what goes on in there? And I said to my dad at one point, I was like 12. I said, dad, I want to know what goes on in there. I want to work there. And he said, okay, you can do that if you want. And um, that, uh, you know, I stayed up for the Oscars every year until, uh, until I'd fall asleep in the, you know, whatever the best actor category, because I was a kid, you know, at like nine or 10 o'clock at night. And, um, and I just, I got my start. I was a music major when I was in college. I was a drummer, but um, not a very good one. And I realized pretty young that I wasn't going to be a good player if I didn't practice. And I just didn't want to practice. I didn't want to spend that kind of time. <laughs> I also didn't want to play on Friday and Saturday night. I wanted to have my weekends off. Yeah. So I found, I, we all had to take a recording class as freshmen. And you learned how recording worked. I thought I was going to learn how a stereo worked. Turns out we learned 24 track recording, like putting four dudes or women in a room, microphones, oh, press wow. record, and you're recording a record, wow. right? And then that got me a job as an intern at a studio. And uh, I, my career just kind of went from there. And I worked on interesting projects that got people's attention, not because of me, but because of the people who I met. And I didn't realize this then, I understand it now. But I worked on Poison's first record. That led me to working for a record label that worked on a bunch of independent indie rock material that then led me to a job at McCann Erickson working on huge features, Terminator 2, Total Recall, Bugsy, The Doors, I mean, stuff like that. Putting Having those on my resume led me to the next thing and the next thing. And then what really blew my career up, I was 30, I was 30, just about almost 31, I got a job as the head of physical production for Oprah Winfrey's film unit in LA, making TV movies and feature films. Wow. And that's when my career took off. And it, when you have the names on your resume, it really does help you. I mean, I like to say that the Hollywood is, uh, there's a phrase, we call it star fuckers, uh, pardon my <laughs> French, but Hollywood is a business to star fuckers. And if you don't have the big titles on your resume or on your credits, it's harder for you to make the inroads. And because I started out working for a guy who was the drummer for a band called Berlin and I worked on a poison record, it all just kind of snowballed. And I said yes to everything that wasn't illegal or immoral and (laughs) did whatever I had to read everything I could get my hands on, did every terrible job. I was young and I figured out what I was good at. I was good at finance and physical logistics at a really young age. I'm the guy with the most obvious creative idea in the room. You don't want me on a movie making new and interesting content because I'm not that guy. And I realized that at a young age and I laid into it. You know, so there you go. one of the things you mentioned uh, is you, you kind of started out your, your career is really networking. How important is networking in, in your career? It is the reason a career exists in Hollywood. There is, you can be brilliant. You can be uh, the greatest thing since sliced bread. 
Uh, but if you haven't networked in the business with the people who have access to distribution and financing, you will go nowhere, whether you're a director, a writer, or an actor. You have to, if you're a writer, you got to get dressed into real clothes that aren't, don't have stains on them and it's not your sweats <laughs> and go hang out with people in the industry. If you're an actor, you have to get out there and meet people. Uh, you got to go to auditions. You have to meet casting directors, not producers. Producers will never get you a job. Their job in their eyes is to get in your pants. So you need to meet <laughs> casting directors to some extent, directors, producers are not going to get you a job. And that's what I, I blog about these things all the time, because I want people to understand what the industry is and how do you succeed in it? It is a black box. It is hard. And it's not, and there's a million people who want to do it, but you, it is networking. Like you said, it is the lifeblood of your career. And the day you stop managing it and the day you stop feeding it is the day your career begins to atrophy. So would you say that, you know, you mentioned success. Do you feel that part of that success is networking in order for you to be successful? You kind of have to be a good networker. You do. And it doesn't have to be sleazy and really sort of, oh, that's so gross. He's selling me something. It's, it's as simple as just, Figuring out who the players are. That's kind of step one. Now step one is, what do you want to do? You want to work in reality? You want to work in features? You want to work in dramatic television? You want to work in half-hour sitcoms? You want to work in the award shows or sports or whatever you want to do in entertainment? You have to pick a vertical. And then once you pick that vertical, you need to research it. Who are the players in the business? Who's actually making content? How's the industry structured? Once you do that, you'll have a list of people, probably a couple hundred deep, who actually work on these projects. And then you have to decide what you want to do, writer, director, actor, crew, or producer. You're not going to be a writer, director. Someday you might, but you're not going to start out doing that. You're going to start out doing some one thing yep. and do just that and tell everybody that's what you're doing. And then you need to get connected to those people. If you want to be an actor, casting directors. If you want to be a writer, go be a writer's assistant somewhere. If you want to be a director, go be an assistant to a director. And if you want to be a producer, go work in development. And if you want to write or direct or produce, go work in development. Great places to get connected. And you have to get connected to producers who are actually making content. Do they have something on the air uh, in the past six months? And do they have multiples on the air? Or have they produced something 10 years ago and they were a name and now they're gone? Um, are they making a feature? Have they had a feature in the in the theater in the past 18 months? If they haven't, they likely aren't going to in the future. Maybe, but this is a business that finds people that are successful and they lay into them over and over and they repeat and they rinse and repeat until they stop making money. And then they move on to the next big thing. It's unfortunate. It's a sad state of affairs, but that's the reality of the business. So you have to find those people and stick to them like a barnacle and stick to the people that work under them. Those are the people you're going to meet. You're not going to meet Joss Whedon. You're not going to meet JJ Abrams, or you might, but they're not going to give you a job. Yeah. The people who work for them, they might. And that's the people you network with. Yeah. You have to pick the, find the vertical, find the job, find the people with the money and the distribution or who have access to money, and then go stick to them like a barnacle and find out who, who in their staff. I mean, when I say find out, I mean, literally figure out their names. What's the name of the staff writer on whatever project you love? Mm -hmm. Get to know that. Yeah. Find those people. Cold call them. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with cold calling. I've talked about cold calling on the show before. In fact, um, recently I talked about self-publishing and the importance yeah. of that, you know, because yeah. like you mentioned, just getting content out there, right? And, yep. and getting things out there. In fact, you're kind of men mentioning content. Uh, content. Let's talk about managing a content business because that's what you are and, and scale at scale. How, do you, how yeah. do you kind of continue to do that? So can we talk about your business in particular? Yeah, you. It, it, we are managing content at scale and at speed. This business runs 150 miles an hour. When you get in it, you are either driving or sitting inside a car driving down the road 150 miles an hour. And every other car around you is either parked or driving slower than you. That is just the nature of it. So if that's not something um, that you can process quickly and that you like, uh, this business probably isn't for you. But if it is something you like and love, then this is the place where you're going to get it. It is an adrenaline buzz all the time. And you're at the front end of the culture war that's happening every day. It's a war happening today. It wasn't a war when I was a kid. It was just it was just business, which is its own kind of battle and war. But nonetheless, uh, you were at the front of culture. So managing it at scale is a labor intensive and time intensive process. There is no two ways about it. I have been in the trenches of filmmaking, of post-production, of making records, of the finance side of it. 
At this point in my career as a CFO, I do about 10 of them a year, 10 two hour TV movies for Lifetime and Hallmark, lots of Christmas movies. Uh, and there's then they're complicated financing arrangements that have to do with multiple currencies. So it, it's it's esoteric and it's it's uh, it's pretty complicated. But once you do it, you have a pattern for it. And the same thing is true of everything in production. Whatever you do, you build a pattern in a system for replicating it, and you apply people to it. It it takes people, editors. Uh, when I say editor, I mean picture editors, cameramen, camera uh, people who work in all different departments. When you get a screenplay, the first thing you do is you read it once for enjoyment. Because after that, you're going to know the the whole thing. I mean, literally every piece of dialogue you're going to understand. And then you break it down. Every single scene has a certain number of actors. It has a cost associated with it. They have to work on a certain number of days. You build a schedule. You break down a screenplay. That screenplay, that breakdown gets turned into a budget. That budget gets turned into an action plan that you then execute over a short period of time, anywhere from 12 weeks to 12 months. Big features, you know, big tent poles, maybe 24 months, but not very common. And you're just breaking everything down into its constituent parts, building schedules or systems. There's ideas and ways of tracking this kind of uh, volume of data. It's a huge volume. And the systems have been around since the 50s. Nothing's really changed. It's just turned into uh, a technological edge a little bit. You know, we use software to do a lot of it, but it hasn't really changed. The, the process of making film, except Mandalorian changed this in the past couple of years. Uh, the plates that we see now, as far as screens in the background, uh, that's changed substantially. I won't go into it because we can get deep into the weeds on that. But um, <laughs> the process of making movies hasn't really changed since Charlie Chaplin was making movies. It, okay, the, the tools have changed. But, you know, you put two people in a space, you put a camera looking left to right, and then you shoot that person, like Charlie Chaplin. And then you turn the lights around on the other side against Charlie Chaplin's back to the person he's talking to on the other side. That hasn't really changed in almost 100 years. Uh, it's gotten more complicated. The coverage is deeper. But by and large, that pr is a is a you are drinking from a fire hose you you know your average two-hour movie for the longest time shot one hundred and fifty thousand feet of film wow now they can shoot as much as a million Jesus. but and, and that's and film doesn't really get used much anymore it's mostly digital but your average film shot one hundred and fifty thousand feet of film every single camera roll that gets pushed through a camera is a thousand feet or 400 depending on what you're buying uh, of 35 millimeter film. So someone's managing that thousand feet roll and it's about 10 to 12 minutes of footage, sometimes eight, depending on what you're doing. Um, so you you have this thing where it's a thousand feet of film that might have 10 takes of six scenes. Somebody had to go document all that and give it to editorial who then transfers it into video so they can cut it on an offline editing system so that we can later go back to that film and cut it up and turn it into something, right? So it's 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 drinking from a fire hose and it's managing all of that data that's coming at you uh, on a regular basis. And there are systems out there and it just takes a lot of people and a lot of time. Yeah, you know, you're, you're talking about quite a bit of time, quite a bit of effort. But, you know, I'm, I'm also thinking, what's the where's the where's the quick guy? Where's the quick guy to making an income as a filmmaker? Is there a quick guy to making income as a filmmaker? A quick guide? There isn't one. Movies, the, the, and this has been true for the since the dawn of of the of content, going back to books and all the rest of it. You are competing for people's time to open up their wallet to pay you for your content. Mm -hmm. I hate that word, content, but it is what it is. It's movies and television in my world. Yeah. So you 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 have to make something that's compelling enough to, for people to pay you for it. Otherwise, they're going to go steal it, or they're going to watch a friend's or they're just going to see free stuff on TikTok, right? When I started in the business, there were three networks. There were a few local affiliates on television and local markets and movies, and that was it, and books. And, you know, as time goes on, distractions happen, and you have to convince people to open up their wallet to pay you. That is very difficult. It's not easy. We do it in Hollywood by creating spectacle and turning actors into royalty. That is essentially what we've done for 100 years that system is starting to unwind. It's unraveling slowly, but it's unraveling. 
we have convinced everybody that everything we make is brilliant and or hysterical because we make these trailers and it's it's marketing's job to do that right right we make these trailers that show you the movie in six minutes or three minutes yeah, and you're like yeah. oh that looks amazing let's go watch it and you get out you're like i just watched the trailer but i took 90 minutes of my life there was nothing new here yeah and i cost me 100 bucks to take my kids and buy popcorn <laughs> right so um the point is uh there is no quick start guide but there is a common thread and the common thread is you're making something people haven't seen before and it can be a 15 year old hasn't seen or it can be a 55 year old those are different animals, you know, as far as the, what they've been exposed to of all kinds of content over their lifetime. A 15-year-old sees a Marvel movie. They're like, oh, my God, it's amazing. A 55-year-old goes, oh, again? Really? Didn't I read this when I was a kid in Mr. Bowman's class when I was bored of math? <laughs> you know, I pulled it out of my backpack and I was yeah. thumbing through my comic book. So, um you know, it's it's different, and you're marketing to different people at different life different times in their life. So there isn't a quick guide. You got to be creative. You got to be different. If you're making a movie about your story, or you're writing a story about you, what you understand, what you know, you're gonna bore everyone. No one gives a shit about you. They just don't. They care about themselves. So what they want to see are they want to see content. This is my opinion. I think people go watch movies and read books to play out their fears and anxieties so they can better understand how to deal with that in their own lives because they're watching it in somebody else's life. This is how this person deals with it. This is how this person communicates. We emulate, we model, we men we create those characters and those circumstances we see. We turn them into mentors about how we're going to deal with those circumstances in our lives. Like what do you do if you got a great white shark coming at you? I don't know. I'm not going to turn around and swim like a uh, like a seal, right? They're going to try to avoid that. You don't want to be wearing an all black wetsuit splashing on the water on a surfboard. Try to avoid that, right? Yeah. So anyway, uh, I don't think there is any quick guide, but I think uh, at, if you're good at if you've figured out how to tap into an audience, you have captured lightning in a bottle that most people in Hollywood spend millions of dollars and thousands of people's um, time to create, to open up their wallet. And we do it at scale for a 12, whatever billion dollar industry, right? Yeah. In fact, so, you know, you're, you're kind of talking about, you know, this, um, you, you talked about the, the, the uh, 30 minute or, you know, three minute um, advertising for the actual movie, right? The, the nice little clip there. And then you go to the movies and you're like, I just saw this entire movie, but yeah. just through this three minute clip, how do you continue to create content to get me as a consumer back to the theater? Uh, well, as an executive, you do that by finding people who are brilliant, right? You do it by finding the J.J. Abrams of the world or the the Damon Lindelof and um, can't remember his writing partner from Lost. Uh, but nonetheless, those two guys, you know, and there's other people like it and they all have deals at one of the studios, right? And they get paid seven figures just to be, making content for a studio that, you know, is making billions of dollars, right? That's their job. So you find the people who are good at it and you do that by, you know, giving them a chance, you know, Soderbergh's first movie and he's made, you know, Ocean's 12, Ocean's 11, lots and lots of money and a bunch of other projects in between. But before that he made Sex, Lies and Videotape that he, he says he wrote in 14 days. I have no reason to dis, to disbelieve him. Uh, he wrote that in 14 days in a car ride across the country from New York to LA or LA to New York. I forget which, um, you know, you find people like that and you give them a shot to make small projects. You know, you get a small thing and then, you know, your career blows up overnight over the course of 10 years, right? That's always the joke in Hollywood. His career blew up overnight. Well, I've been doing it for 10 or 15 years, right? I saw Sex, Lies, and Videotape. I saw Schizopolis. And now he's a big, or she is a big actor, writer, or director. So it's incremental. And I think the same thing applies at a smaller scale if you're a content creator and an entrepreneur of your own, where you're making content for your little world, right? Yeah. You have to build a business where your income on the top, your expenses on the bottom, are your income's greater than your expenses. And you slowly build that over time. And it's not a, if you build it, they will come. To some extent, maybe you're just trying everything. The movie business tries 
probably three or 400, I don't remember how many it is anymore, features a year. Used to be about 400 regularly. It's probably down to about 125 every weekend. And some of those work, you know, gangbusters. They blow up, they're huge, they're Maverick, right? Maverick 2. Others, they don't, they crater and they don't even make their money back. Yeah. And then the same thing is true in streaming. You know, they make something and they see if it works. And if people start to watch it, it shows up on your screen. It gets recommended to you constantly. So um, start small, start with your little audience. If you figured out how to get money or make some uh, some margin, um, in other words, meaning income is greater than expenses, that's the margin, the difference between them. If you can pocket some margin, then just do more of that and then keep trying new things. Don't rest on your laurels. That's how Hollywood careers end because they keep making the same thing over and over. Are we tired of Chris Nolan's time fracturing and blowing our mind with, oh, wait, the future is happening in the present and there's parallel times happening? Yeah, we're getting bored of that. Is it going to continue? Maybe. Or maybe he'll figure something else out where it just blows your mind. Yeah. So that's the thing. You can't rest on your laurels. You know, you being an executive, you know, in this in this Hollywood um, kind of area, this market, what would you say are some of the most difficult things that you run into and as an executive that you're like, man, I didn't know I'd have to think about that. And maybe it's just a Hollywood specific thing that maybe it's not really something that maybe other industries have to think about. That's interesting. I don't think I've ever been asked that question. Um the thing that I don't think there was anything that really ever caught me by surprise, at least not in my job now. Certainly human behavior always catches me by surprise. People's <laughs> willingness and ability to do stupid shit that is <laughs> that is counter to their own best interests is will will never cease to amaze. I got me. visions of the jackass movie going through my head right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, those guys made a lot of money, they but a shit ton when of we money. were on the road making that movie, it was like you're going to do what? You're going to put a car where? And what? Wait. And my brain was like, I remember coming back, we had come off the road. We were out for probably eight or 10 weeks. And my friend Craig, who's you know no longer with us, but um, Craig and I were walking across the parking lot and Steve-O was on the ground uh, lying with his legs up. Knoxville's holding a beer bong and the other end of that beer bong is in Steve-O's butt. And I turned to Craig and I said, is that a is that Steve-O getting a beer bong up his ass? And he went, yeah. I went, oh, okay. And when I sat down, we were coming back from lunch. When I sat down at my desk, I, I turned to Craig and I went, we got to find someplace else to work, man. Because we just walked across the parking lot thinking that that's normal. But I guess that was probably one of the movies that surprised me the most. You know, those guys... Every other movie I've ever worked on and every other actor, director I've ever been around or worked for, including Oprah, when they're on camera, they're doing their thing. Whatever yeah. that is, they're doing it, right? It's a part they're playing. Yeah. Those guys, it was 24-7. You're seeing who they are on camera, on screen all the time. I don't know they're like that anymore. They were all in their 20s at the time. Yeah. I can't imagine they're in their 30s or 40s the same way. But um, – you know, and that, a lot of that was fueled by drugs and alcohol, which is no secret or a surprise to anybody. Um, but that's the thing I guess that's surprising, was surprising to me, was how those guys were on all the time. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, it's it, this is a money business. You know, it is a real business. It's a tens of billion dollar business. It's small in comparison to just about everything else, um, especially games and other kinds of tech. But um you know, it is a business. And if you don't think of it as a business and yourself as an entrepreneur, we get paid mostly, unless you're organized as your own corporation, but we get paid as individuals through payroll. But the reality is we're all freelance who work in film production. And you are, you're an entrepreneur. You are driving your own business. You're always networking. You're always selling. It doesn't have to be sleazy. It can just be, hey man, what are you working on? Uh, just catching up. You know, I, I I actually calendar that catching up with friends of mine who are in key positions every three to six months, depending on what's going on. Some people I talk to all the time. And then I'll call up and say, hey, man, what are you working on? They'll tell me. And then I'll say, oh, by the way, I'm looking for work. If you know someone who's looking for a production accountant or a line producer or whatever I'm doing at the time, mm -hmm. uh, throw my name around. I'm, I'm looking. So that's part of the thing. You are an entrepreneur, whether you're a grip, electric, camera, producer, writer, director, actor. 
There is no agent who's going to find you work and make you rich and build your career. Ain't going to happen. The only people they will sign are people who are already successful or people who have percolated up through the system, winning some kind of an award, whether it's a script mm -hmm. competition or something like that. I hear all the time, I got to get an agent, got to get a manager. You don't. You will be the person who drives your career. What an agent or manager does for you is they will get you into places that you're not already at, that you don't have access to. And they will make deals that are in your best interest and better than you'll be able to make on your own because they understand what everybody else is making because they're doing it for all over town at every other uh, company. And they know that, you know, you go to Disney, you're not going to get paid well. You go to Paramount, there was a time when you would get paid well. You want to get paid well, go to Sony. You want to get paid well, go to go to Warner's. Those are the places that have traditionally paid well. Now it's uh, Netflix. Now it's HBO. Those are the places that are paying people top dollar. Hulu, yeah, you'll get paid half of what you'll get paid to do the same thing at Netflix. But in order to go to Netflix, you got to be a star so that they can go be a star fucker. That's sort of the grind, right? Yeah. So anyway, uh, th that's the part that was kind of surprising to me is how um, two things, I guess I'll circle back to your question. One is um, the thing that really surprised me was the shows you work on, the the credits you establish, those are as important as the, as the people you work with. And the people you work with are just as important. And the other thing is uh, you have to find uh, a system for networking that is um, that manages your career like an entrepreneur. You're, no one's going to do it for you. You're going to do it for yourself. Uh, and there, and you're, you're not always going to have the freedom of that on most entrepreneurs have yeah. making decisions about what you want to do and not do. Sometimes you just got to suck it up and do the terrible project because you need to make a job. You got to make a living. And honestly, that's what jackass was for me. I needed to make a living. Yeah. My friend was the line producer on the project. I called him up and said, Hey man, I'm out of work. Um, do you know anything that's going on? He's like, you know what? I have this job as a coordinator. You didn't do that. You did that like 10 years ago. You want to do it. I'm like, yeah, what are you working on? He says, jackass. And I said, you mean that TV show on MTV? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. I said, yeah, that's funny. I've seen a few episodes. That kind of made me laugh. And I did it. And it turned out to be an amazing experience and a lot of fun. But um, I needed a job. Yeah. You, know? you know, I had come off working for Oprah at the time, making award winning you know, feeling move, movies about, you know, people who had emotions to that. Yeah. Totally different. Yeah. And you have, you never know what's going to happen. You know, you mentioned um, you, you're, you're like a freelancer, right? And so you're out there yeah. kind of networking, getting new positions. Have you ever had a moment of self doubt? All the time. All the time. Yeah. I mean, yes, I have those moments of self doubt. And so does everybody. Anybody who tells you they don't, they're full of shit. <laughs> yeah. um, or they're a, <laughs> fucking megalomaniac and who that's not interesting to that's be or interesting. to no talk to, to that person <laughs> right i mean there's plenty of that in this business there's lots of people who are just you know rapacious make money that's all they care about it's not about anything else and they'll run over whoever they want right whoever is in their way they'll just run right over and there are plenty of names we know them they're big names and they exist right but um yeah self-doubt is is it's a natural human emotion honestly and so is procrastination. It, it, it is what it's what makes us a human human beings, right? So, yeah, I've had my moments. There have been projects I said yes to, and I was like, "Oh shit, how am I going to do that?" You know, I wake up at three o'clock in the morning, going, "Ah, damn, what? Not enough money, yeah. not enough time." That's the friction. That is what it is, right? And uh, it's hard. You, but, you know, you take a step every day, right? Hopefully you'll take 10 steps, 10 steps forward and you'll get knocked back three or four steps on a clip. But six months later, you look back and you're like, God, I'm seven steps forward, man. How did I do that? How did I get here? Yeah. It is, it is a mystery how people build careers in this, in this industry. Uh, it is very strange. There is no straight line path. And who would have thought I'd be a CFO at this point in my career? I did it because I was done traveling. I spent 17 years on the road chasing movies around the world. Amazing experience. But I was on my first wedding anniversary to my now ex-wife. I was uh, in Monterey, Mexico, working on a baseball, Little League baseball movie. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to have a family. And I was like, you know what? I don't want this to be my life. I want to be around for my kid. I want to be around for my wife. I want to build a family. And it's time for me to make a change. So I started looking for jobs 
in finance where I my, my background came from and uh, in in physical production, my background in school, I have a degree in advertising, nothing to do with anything I do now. But um, I started looking for stability in a regular job. That's how I wound up working as a CFO. And that was 2009, 13 years ago. You know what you mentioned, like, you know, taking steps forward and, and seven steps forward and maybe taking three steps back, but then or 10 steps forward, three steps back, but now you're seven steps ahead. Right. Yeah. And, you know, taking a look back at, you know, being a kid, seeing the gates, determining what's going on behind these gates, would love to figure out what what continues to motivate you every day to kind of get you up to deal with the grind. What motivates you? Uh, the It's doing this for a living is cryptography. It's never the same. It's always different. The personalities are different. Sometimes you're working with someone, people who are great. Sometimes you're working with an asshole. It just depends. And uh, it's interesting and fascinating all the time. And it's not the same. I'm not the brain who can do insurance, like gang, gang, cookie cutter, <laughs> cookie, cookie cutter. I'm not that guy. It's different. Uh, you know, agreements come across my desk different. I got to figure out different ways of putting money together to make a project come together. It can be a million different problems you're trying to put out when you're in physical production. Physical production is hard work, long hours, extremely demanding, and there will be a sacrifice in your life. And that sacrifice will be friends and family. If you don't want that to be primary in your life, don't come work in film production. This work-life balance nonsense is just that. It's nonsense. Something will give. Either you're not going to work in film production going 150 miles an hour for you know, 15, 16 hours a day, as long as you can do that. It's young person's business. It's not something you, I mean, I was 44, 43 when I transitioned away from film production and I was exhausted. I came off the movie in, Mount, in Mexico and I was like, my, my wife at the time had said, I've known you for 10 years. I've never seen you sleep for 14 hours for five or six days straight. And I'm like the guy who gets seven hours of sleep a night, right? Mm -hmm. And she's like, I, this is, and that was the first time I realized this is a business that requires stamina and youth. And the older you get, the harder it is to keep up with those folks. Yeah. So that was also a contributing factor to my change, my desire to change. So, you know, you get out of bed because it's a fascinating business and it's fun. And it's something that um, is, it, it's like putting a puzzle together every day, all the time Yeah. at scale. Yeah, at scale. And so now you're dealing at a large scale and you're obviously, you know, the CFO, you're dealing with a lot of individual employees and things of that nature. But what are, what are some things of you as the CFO being the executive company or being an executive at this company? What are some of those things that keep you up at night? You know, at this point, it's so machine wrote that I'm not sure that anything keeps me up at night. What will wake me up in the middle of the night is when I can't figure out a problem and it's grinding on me for a day or half a day and I go to bed and I haven't figured it out, it could be a math problem. It could be a financing problem. It could be a personality problem. I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll have the answer. Sometimes it's a crap answer, but I'll have an answer. <laughs> I'm not saying they're all good ideas, but sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and it could be anything. It could be just a simple mat, like a worksheet. I'm trying to figure out a budget and I can't figure out why it can't balance. And I'll spend a couple hours on it and then I'll just walk away and go, I, I can't figure this out. And I'll wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, I got to look over there. And then I might find it or I might not, who knows. But you know, there's not a lot of things that keep me up at night. When I was new in, in, in certain jobs, mostly what kept me up at night was expectation. Can I deliver the thing I said I can deliver on time, on budget? Because that was my thing. It was like my job was to deliver whatever. For Oprah, it was deliver quality on budget. Don't lose my money. Those are the words that came out of her mouth. I make plenty of money in Chicago. I don't need to make money on this part of the business. I want to change the way we're making television. I think what's on television is terrible. It's it's all you know headlines ripped from the newspapers, yeah. and that's all really ugly shit, right? Yeah. yeah. She wanted to make... TV movies about books from books. And, you know, she always said, I don't need to make money. I make plenty here in Chicago doing the show, but just don't lose my money. And, you know, the expectation of delivering, you know, at 15, not even an 11, but literally delivering at 15 with not enough money or time and living up to that expectation. That was always the thing that kept me up at night was expectation and delivering high quality 
for whatever I was given. That was like, that's how I'm built. I want to deliver more than um, is expected of me everywhere I go, you know, and not everybody's like that, but that's, that's what always kept me up at night. Yeah. You, you, you've done historically, you've done almost every single role. It seems like within the film industry, but other than maybe acting, right. It seems like maybe, maybe yeah, you did I've done a lot of them. Acting. What, what would you say is your, your favorite role out of them and why? Uh, honestly, the one I'm doing now, if I didn't, I love being a CFO. I I'm, I'm insulated from the nonsense and the politics and the noise at a level at this level that it doesn't affect me. I still encounter it, but it's at a much higher level. It's dealing with network executives who, you know, uh, who are much higher than me or even my clients. And um, so it's doing the job now. Um, but when I was in the trenches, my favorite job that I've ever done outside of this one was working as a production accountant. It sounds like a really uninteresting and stale and boring job, but it's not accounting at all. It just has that title. What it is, is you're estimating the cost of delivering a movie as it's as a, as the wheel is rolling on a truck down the highway 100 miles an hour, right? You're looking at snapshots in time every morning, every afternoon, end of the week, end of the month, whatever it is, end of production, end of post, end of prep. You're looking at the cost as as a as a static here's what has actually happened comparing it to a budget and then estimating what's the future delivery cost and the timeline and the schedule of what we're currently doing that to me was my favorite job and i developed a reputation as the guy who could do that within a thousand dollars on a multi-million dollar project and did a couple of times but i'm I'm exaggerating a thousand i actually did deliver one movie i delivered a benji movie which was a you know, five or $6 million picture for a uh, million dollars. I'm sorry, a thousand dollars, I think under budget, I don't know if it's under or over, but I was literally within a thousand dollars what my original estimate was. And that's what it turned out to be. So within 5% or less of what we estimated uh, the cost, that was, that was my place. That's, that's what I did. And um, you know, that was, that was always the most fun. I, that was the job I had the most fun doing. Nice. Now, in addition to all these positions you've done in the film industry, you've recently came out with a book, uh, How to Make It in Hollywood. So let's, one, let's talk about a little about the book. What kind of inspired you to write it and how did you publish it? Did you self-publish it or did you go through a publishing company? I self-published. I didn't even bother with a publishing company. I have no interest in dealing with that nonsense, you know, <laughs> hat and hat and groveling. And I say the same thing to filmmakers. It's no different. You know, just do it yourself. We live in a time when you can write a book, make a TV show, make a movie, whatever you want, and you can exhibit it and market it to people directly without any, without an intermediary. Yep. So um, that hasn't happened ever in the history of content or the human race, right? Um, so I did write a book. The book is about how to make it in Hollywood. And what it does is it breaks down in a methodical process, how do you get, get connected to Hollywood? I get emails. I'm out on social everywhere, right? You can find me just about everywhere through my blog or wherever, uh, social, everything. And I pretty much answer most everything. I constantly get the email. Will you read my script? No, I'm not going to read your script. <laughs> Neither will anybody who actually reads for a living, who reads scripts for a living. They want to see a one or two page beat sheet. That's it. And then they maybe want to see a treatment, but they want to know what your idea is about. Is it, a, does it a, is it a story? Does it have a through line? I'm a finance guy. If you want help from me, you need to tell me what you do and you needs to be in my vertical, right? So I had a girl who was graduating from um, Northridge, which is a state college here in Southern California. Uh, she was graduating with a finance degree and was interested in working in film production in finance. And I, she asked me, how do I do it? And I was like, I can help this girl. I can't read your script. I can't come to your showcase. Right. I'm not going to help you. It's not what I do. So understanding what people do is important in terms of making that connection. Like you said, cold calling, but you have to be relevant. You have to know who you're talking to. And I don't mean like, oh my God, you don't need to be obsequious and talk about how amazing they are. You just need to understand their place in the world. And if you can do that in with an executive or a mid-level person, you can make a connection through an informational interview and just ask yeah. them the simple question, how'd you get to where you are? I'm interested in doing that. And then you shut up and listen for 20 minutes. And when you're finished, 
You just say, oh, that's amazing. You play back a couple of data points they talked about so they understand that you were actually listening. Um, you know, whatever they are, their favorite thing, their favorite title, their favorite job. Um, and then you, at the end, you say, um, do you know anybody else who I could talk to who's in a similar position? I'm just out talking. And uh, by the way, here's my resume. I'm looking for a job as a, and insert the assistant job of your choice that you're trying to reach. And my book talks about all of those things. How do you research the titles, the projects, the verticals, the people working on them? You build a list. How do you connect with them on DM and email and cold call? And then once you do that, how do you how do you connect with them? How do you how do you build that relationship? Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't, but nonetheless, it sort of walks you through that process and gives you a tangible step by step. Like here's how the business works. Here's how you're going to be able to get into it as an assistant. And I think you're better off working as an assistant and someone's desk than being a waitress or a bartender. That is a waste of time. You're literally spending two hours a week in the grind with people making decisions, maybe if you're auditioning and, and you're out there, as opposed to spending 80 or 100 hours a week in the grind, working on someone's desk, learning the landscape of who's making content, who isn't, who's useless, who isn't. There's plenty of useless people in this town and they don't really, you know, they don't hide it. They don't, they, they hide it really well. They don't, they don't make it obvious to you who is useless and who isn't. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now, what, what are some advice you would give some of these listeners at home, either from an actor perspective or from an entrepreneurial perspective? What advice would you give them? Well, uh, from an entrepreneurial perspective, you have to remember in this business, you are an entrepreneur. You are running your own career. You're going to make decisions about what to do and what not to do. No one's going to do it for you. And surround yourself with really good people as best as you can find, as best as is available to you. And it also, that also goes back to the second point that I make to people all the time, which is worry less about your title and how much money you're making. Worry about the projects you get on and worry about the people you're working with. Projects you get on need to be big names, splashy early on in your career. You want to work an independent, go work for the studios, understand the landscape, figure out who the indies are, and then go work an independent. You're not going to go from independent to studio. It's never going to happen. You may one day become one of those people, but honestly, you don't really want to be, you know, but you're basically doing someone else's job at a studio as far as delivering content for them, as opposed to doing something that feeds your soul and you're really interested in. And the other thing is I've worked on a lot of crap in my career. Not everything was great. Some have been, and there's some were jobs I was really, really interested in doing. And some weren't when I say jobs, meaning projects, um, you're going to work on a lot of crap. And you got to make a living. There's nothing wrong with that. Not everything needs to be huge. Not everything needs to be a big name, but you do need to surround yourself with people who are working on those big projects and worry about what projects you can put on your credits and worry about the people paying business. Your average, you know, PA working on a set, they make thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a week after overtime and all the rest of it. You know, you give up your life, you're an indentured servant to somebody yeah. for some period of time. And it's it's I hear it all the time. It's soul crushing. Is it really, really pushing paper for an insurance company? That's not soul crushing. No. You have the most amazing job that a thousand people are around the corner and want your job and would kill you for it. And by the way, they'll step over your body in the process of killing you to get that job. Yeah, They won't even move it out of the way, politely bury it in the shallow grave in the <laughs> desert. They're just going to walk right over you. And I can tell you from, uh, you know, my wife is insurance. It is soul crushing. I will tell you. Right now. But it's a living. She it's makes a living. Money. She makes a good living out of it. She hates it, but it's a living, right? <laughs> yeah. And there's there's interesting people, I'm sure, but you know, it's it's not that interesting. And yeah. working in movies is. And yeah. if you want to do that, it's it's hard work. Yeah. And there's a lot of competition. And quit bitching about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of hard work. Now, before we go, Tim, tell the folks at home how they can, you mentioned you're on the social, uh, where they can find you. What's your website? How can they find your book? Well, the best place uh, you, to get the book, that's the fastest, just uh, the book. It talk, we'll talk about it. You can order it there. It's all digital download. Uh, it's career.timtortora.com. And my last name is spelled T-O-R-T-O-R-A. And then if you want to connect with me, I you can go to my page, timtortora.com. 
Uh, you can connect with all the social. It's up on the right. Just click whatever. It'll take you to it. And then I have a form at the bottom where you can ask a question. You want to know something about the industry? Just ask a straight up question. Don't ask me to read your material, you know, <laughs> to watch your thing. I'm not going to do it. I don't have time. Makes sense. And I'm not, I'm not going to be able to help you. But if you have a question about, and by the way, I'm not going to raise your money for your film. If anybody's sitting here thinking, <laughs> oh, this is a guy who can go raise Shit. money for my movie. I mean, goes no, I'm not. <laughs> I am. I can do that, but I'm not going to. I'm going to raise money for the clients who pay me. Yeah. That's I don't do anything on the IFCOM. That's the other thing I want to add too, really quick. Uh, advice to people in the industry. In Hollywood, we make money. We never spend money. We spend other people's money, meaning studio, network, streamer, but we don't pay to get auditions. We don't pay to find money. We don't pay to, to get our material shown to executives around town. Do not pay for any of it. If you're a writer, maybe a reader. Hire a reader, hire someone who can go through your material. That's less than a hundred bucks, maybe a hundred, right? Um, if you are a writer and you're getting into award show or you're getting into competitions, that costs money. Same thing with directors. And I recommend every writer do all of that. Get into the festivals, same with directors. Get into festivals, get your stuff in, get it seen. It's going to cost you some money, 30, 40 bucks, you know, sometimes higher to do that. But um, we we get paid. We don't pay money to do anything. And the, if we ever pay any money, max it's 150, 200 bucks each time. So don't spend a couple thousand dollars to get your name and your face into a book so that you can be a star. Not going to happen. Nice. Those people are, people are sleazebags. And they're grifters. They're just stealing from you. They just want the money, man. Yeah. That is, that so anyway, is great advice. If, yeah. And if you want to ask me a question in the on the form in the bottom right on my on my page, uh, they come to me or they come to my assistant, and uh, I pretty much answer all of them unless you ask me to raise money for your movie and read your script. <laughs> okay, <laughs> folks. So you're here, here here. Don't be sending in scripts or, or asking to raise money. This information again will have all the information on the uh, Shades of E newsletter. So please visit the Shades of E dot com to subscribe to the newsletter. You can also follow me at the Shades of E on Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, TikTok and Facebook. Other than that, have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.